There was excitement in the air as the eyes of the nation and the Ohio State Buckeyes greeted the Texas Tech Red Raiders to Columbus. Some 2,000 Red Raider faithful were there to cheer Spike and the Raiders on. For Ohio State, it was the season opener, tailgate parties, and a band of 750 strong. So let's get the season started. Come on, get with it. It's the season opener on week two of Video Season Ticket. Hi everybody and welcome to Columbus, Ohio. Columbus sits in the southeastern portion of the state. Cleveland, just about 120 miles to the north, and Cincinnati, just a little further than that, to the west. Columbus is a town that was founded in the early 1800s. Today, some 600,000 residents make their home here in a city that features old churches and a revitalized downtown, as you can see by the skyline. It was a rainy Friday morning that greeted the Red Raiders as they landed in Columbus, boarded their buses, and made their way to the hotel for lunch and the not-so-easy chore of finding rooms for a 100-plus traveling party. It was then on to the historic Ohio State Stadium for a final workout. The Raiders worked on the newly installed grass field and tried to become accustomed to the famed 92,000-seat Horseshoe Stadium. A big game? You bet, as ABC sent four remote trucks and set up a telecommunication city with over 100 crew members, 10 cameras, and Brent Musburger and Dick Vermeil to call the action. What we're looking for is primarily a passing game from both teams. We have 10 cameras. We're going to have uh, ISOs and primary three receivers. Um, the backfield and the two wide, the uh, flanker, uh, and the quarterbacks. We're going to know what, what Fry is going to do, and, it should, and Gill, it should be a good game. Hopefully. Un unusual for Texas Tech to be on national TV. Yes, yes. This is my first time ever doing them, but we're looking forward to it. We hope it's going to be a good contest. Okay. Friday came to a close with coaches and players surrounding Spike Dykes in the middle of the horseshoe field. It is now 9.30 on Saturday morning. The alumni band from Ohio State University is practicing. It is a tradition here that they will play with the regular band during each football game. Behind me you see the historic 92,000 seat Ohio State University Stadium. Built in 1922 for a cost of $1 million, it has played host to some historic games with Harvard, Notre Dame, and Michigan. But on this day it doesn't matter. It is now 931 and the tailgaters are here. They're ready to see the Ohio State Buckeyes play Texas Tech University. So enough of the pregame. Let's go get this contest started. Hello again, everybody. I'm Ray Gaskin. Welcome to Ohio Stadium in Columbus for the first ever meeting between the Red Raiders and the Ohio State Buckeyes. 88,000 fans here today, including more than 2,000 who made the trip north from Texas Tech. The Red Raiders won the toss and elected to put the defense on the field to start the football game. So the Red Raiders Lynn Elliott kicks off. Game getting underway around 3.30 in the afternoon. Robert Smith on the return for the Buckeyes takes it up the far sideline. It's an excellent return of 34 yards for Ohio State. On first and 10 from the 45, Scotty Graham goes over right guard for seven yards. Then six plays later, as we watch from the reverse angle, Raymond Harris on the counter cuts over the inside right tackle for nine. A few plays later on fourth down from the two, Greg Fry fakes, runs over the right side, but a great defensive stand by the Raiders stops Ohio State. Now the Red Raiders on the attack. Anthony Lynn from Salina, Texas, taking the pitch and coming around left in, goes out of bounds after a gain of seven. A bit later, Lynn over the left side. As you watch from the reverse angle, a gain of 15 yards. Lynn with some big shoes to fill, following in the steps of James Gray. Now, Jamie Gill back to pass, and he is sacked. Meanwhile, 
The grounds crew pretty busy Saturday afternoon repairing the divots in the stadium's brand new natural turf. We go to second quarter action now. Jeff Ballman punting for Ohio State. Sophomore Tracy Saul from Idaloo fumbles the ball and the Buckeyes recover at the 29. Three plays later on this drive. It's ball is at the 18 yard line. Greg Fry hands off. The football is fumbled and it's recovered by defensive end Marcus Washington. There were lots of miscues in the second quarter. Fry trying to pass it by Mike Lissio, son of Tony Lissio, the former Cowboy great, and Mike Dubisky recovers for Tech. Now on the offense, the Red Raiders, Jamie Gill passing for Anthony Mannyweather, but this is a live football, and the Ohio State Buckeyes come up with a recovery. Fry passing now, caught by Bobby Olive, but he fumbles, and Tracy Saul recovers. Lots of miscues in the football game. Now about seven minutes left in the first half. It's Gill back to throw. He hits Lynn. He carries for a first down to the Ohio State 11-yard line. Then three plays later, after the Ohio State defense toughens up, Lynn Elliott boots a 26-yard field goal. The Red Raiders lead three to nothing before a subdued Ohio Stadium crowd. Late second quarter now, Fry to pass. Marcus Washington comes up with a big sack for the Red Raiders. And then following a tech fumble late in the second quarter, Charles Rowe comes to the rescue with a Red Raider recovery to preserve the three to nothing halftime lead. Texas Tech in their first ever meeting against a Big Ten team and against Ohio State playing very well defensively in the first half. We go to third quarter action now with the Raiders still leading three to nothing. Fry goes to Edwards moving in the right flat for a gain of 14 yards. On the very next play, Fry wants to go to the air again. He looks out in the right flat, sees Olive. He breaks tackles. How about this great individual effort? It's a gain of 32 yards for the Buckeyes receiver. On the very next play, first and 10 at the Tech 32. Smith with the pitch around right in goes for eight yards. And still moving with the ball. Fry goes out to the right. To stable line at the flag, but it's broken up beautifully by Tracy Saul. And then Tim Williams comes in to try a field goal from 32 yards out. The kick is good, and the Buckeyes have tied the game at three apiece. Still further action in the third quarter. As you can see, the Buckeye fans have come to life. It's second down and eight at the 26. Fry fakes to the right. He's sacked by Petty for a loss of five. Then on fourth down, Bowman. Punts the ball. It's a good kick of 44 yards. Tracy Saul on the receiving end finds a crease momentarily and takes it up the middle for a gain of 11 yards. Then one of the big plays of the game. It's Jamie Gill back to pass. He's looking for Lynn down the left sidelines. He's got it on the run. And Lynn goes in for the touchdown. It's a 52-yard TD play. Let's have another look from ground level. Beautifully executed. Great timing between quarterback Gill and Lynn on the receiving end as he turns on the speed and the Raiders go in for the go-ahead touchdown. The extra point is good and Texas Tech is shocking Ohio State by a score of 10 to three. But on the Buckeyes next offensive possession they have a first and 15 at the 18 yard line. Fry throws to the outstanding freshman Smith as he cuts out into the right flat, slips a tackle, slips another, and goes out of bounds after gaining 24 yards. Then it's Smith again around right in as he breaks clear for a gain of 39 yards. What a great back he's going to be for Coach John Cooper at Ohio State. Still further action in the third quarter. It's second down and goal at the two. Robert Smith, after the fake, slides in for the touchdown. Ohio State gets the extra point. Once again, we're knotted, this time at 10 apiece following a short punt. Robert Smith, a name we've been calling a lot this afternoon, takes the pitch. He's hit by Kenneth Banks for a loss of four. And then Fry on second and 14 from the 37 is chased right, throws to Robert Smith, cutting out in the right flat. Watch him come right toward the camera before he's knocked off his feet for a gain of 17. Now we go to fourth quarter action. The Buckeyes trying a chip shot field goal try that would put them ahead, but Tim Williams' boot is no good from only four yards out, and the game is still tied at 10 apiece. But here comes the big play for the Buckeyes. A short line drive kick is taken by Jeff Graham, and he breaks it right down the sidelines. It's a 50-yard punt return, and Ohio State is ahead. 12.47 left in the game. The extra point good at 17-10. Red Raiders are trying to come back. It's Gill to Richard Ross out at the 
twenty four yard line and then a few plays later Gill fakes he passes short for Rodney Blackshear but Judah Herman intercepts and returns around the left end and goes out of bounds at the twenty one yard line Ohio State with a chance to put the game out of reach Robert Smith stopped on a draw for no gain and then on fourth down at the five yard line Smith takes the pitch loses two. the ball is fumbled it's caused by Fred Petty and recovered by David McFarland so can the Raiders come back Lynn on the draw to the left side slips a tackle and takes off for a gain of 19 yards that sets up first and 10 at the Tech 29 Jamie Gill looking to throw but he's sacked hard by Tovar for a loss of nine yards Jamie Gill a tough customer though watch on the replay as he takes this hit by Tovar and is boom belted down but he was only off the field momentarily and came right back in the ball game. The Raiders with time running out now inside three minutes left to play trailing 17 to 10. Gill goes to the air looking for Rodney Blackshear out in the right flat. It's a gain of 13 yards. Two plays later second and 10 at the 41. Gill is back to pass and He's looking out on the left side for Ross. He finds him for a gain of nine yards. Time running out in the game now with only a minute and a half to play. It's fourth down and Spike Dykes gambling going for the long pass to Manny Weather down the sidelines but it's too long and incomplete. Time runs out on the Red Raiders. They lose to Ohio State 17 to 10 but what a game by Texas Tech. Every week we're going to give you an opportunity to meet the assistant coaches on Spike Dykes football staff. We'll have those coaches explain their areas of responsibility and how they promote Texas Tech University. Today we'll meet Doyle Parker, who's the recruiting coordinator at Tech. There are some 100 athletes currently walking on this football team. So I asked Doyle, is that a success and to what he attributes this great walk-on program? There's no doubt about it. You know, I think that's, uh, we were talking today on the reason, uh, all the reasons our walk-on program has been so successful. And I think the biggest reason is the, uh, uh, all the high school coaches in the state of Texas think so much of our head coach and our assistant coaches uh, because that, you know, they're old Texas high school coaches and they relate so good to them. And, uh, you know, they, they know that when they send a walk-on to Texas Tech that he's going to be treated fairly and going to get a good look. I know that uh, Ted Unbehagen made the comment uh, when we were talking to him, a lot of players that play substantial roles here in your football program don't fit the mold. That's true. Whatever the mold is. That's right. How do you end up getting that player on? How does he turn out to be a player for y'all, but nobody else is maybe looking at him? Well, I think that we, uh, you know, because we've been in Texas high schools, mm -hmm. all of us, we, uh, you know, we've seen real good players uh, do a good job in Texas high schools, go on and do well in college, and they may not be quite as tall as some of the schools want to recruit, or they may not be quite as heavy, mm -hmm. or they may be a step slow, but they make up for it in desire and work habits and taking care of their business. and. Uh, you know, we've recruited a lot of 6'1", uh, 6'2", six, six, linemen that uh, a lot of the other large universities uh, don't recruit because they don't think they're tall enough to play. Mm -hmm. Or recruit a, a wide receiver like a Travis Price that may not have that blazing 4'4", four, 4'5", four, four, speed. All he does is make the great catch for you and win ball games for you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, well, I think we've got a great uh, staff that can and see through some of those things and, and pick out those good players. What about the Tech X now that's uh, both viewing the program and uh, interested in Texas Tech, no matter where they are, some as far away as Singapore and things like that? Uh, how can they help you guys in recruiting? I know there's been so many things come down from the NCAA, but how do you like for them to interact with your staff? Well, Eddie, I don't think we can have too many eyes out there looking for good players. Mm -hmm. Of course, the NCAA has taken the uh, alumni and, and the supporters out of the recruiting process, mm -hmm. but they can still uh, look for good players when they go to their uh, high school games to watch or to junior college games. Uh, if they see a good player, uh, we appreciate them calling or dropping a letter 
and letting us know about these players. And we'll check it out because uh, we, in turn, will get in touch with that high school coach. Uh, we'll make our coaches that are recruiting that area aware of that player. And uh, sometimes it'll work out. And, uh, and we appreciate their help in their eyes if they'll uh, just let us know. Final question for you. Uh, as a recruiting coordinator, as a coach on this staff, uh, your philosophy on selling this university? Well, I think any salesman uh, can do a super job if he's got a good product to sell. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got an excellent product to sell. I think it's a great university and a great community. I think the people make up this university. Uh, most universities uh, in the Southwest Conference have got uh, great facilities and buildings and, and degree plans, but I would put our people and the West Texas community and the West Texas people up against anybody because uh, invariably when you go back to a recruit's home after he's made his visit uh, and then you ask that recruit what impressed him most about his visit, he'll tell you the friendliness of this, of this community and this university. One of the things we could do is move Texas Tech to becoming a research university. And part of that is tied into being a graduate university. That is about doubling the graduate enrollment. Right now we have about 25,000 students with some 3,000 of those being graduate students. We'd probably like to remain at about 25,000 students, but we'd like to change the mix a little bit so that about 6,000 of those would be graduate students and 19,000 undergraduate. In so doing, the graduate education is research. Research and teaching go together. They're not two different functions. That's what graduate education is all about. And I think that we can look as one goal is, is really two goals, to become a research institution and to move into about double the size of the graduate program. Now, we have a challenge in that that we think we can overcome that others have not been able to do. And that is that we believe we can become a research university with a significant graduate enrollment without in any way compromising the quality of our undergraduate program. Texas Tech is known throughout the nation by recruiters far and wide for having extremely high quality undergraduates. When they graduate from Texas Tech, it's a quality product. And just this past year, several firms have said in an economic crunch, they used to recruit at 500 universities and now they're recruiting at 50. And Texas Tech is one of those 50. So that quality comes through. So we're not in any way interested in or willing to reduce the quality of our undergraduate program. So that's kind of the challenge we have. Achieve what we want to achieve research-wise, graduate program-wise, and at the same time, keep that quality instruction at the undergraduate level. Our Red Redder grade profile this week is Andre Tillman. He was all Southwest Conference in the early 70s, an All-American and for many years with the Miami Dolphins a great tight end. He played under Jim Carlin at Texas Tech and he says that was an experience. about what happened with Jim Collin. Uh, you know, he came in at the time he was coming in at the same time that I was recruited. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very understandable person. He uh, very a disciplinarian, and he wanted first and foremost of our education, uh, for us to get a good ed education. Football was secondary, but he did want us to play as hard and try to participate and do the things that's necessary in order to uh, really be outstanding in collegiate athletics. Uh, you know, he, I think he was a very clean individual. I don't think anything was really under the uh, table. I think I've never heard the guy really say a prof uh, profanity word, in which he kept, with it. he kept his coaches in line, and I think that, you know, that really made us a better team overall. I mean, we did have some good teams then. We played hard. Uh, played physical within our talent level, and uh, we did uh, have a real good season. Went to some boat? Yeah, we went to some boat games. I mean, I, the, the three out of the four years that I was there, we did go to uh, bowl. We went to side bowl a couple of times, and also we went to Gator Bowl, which was my last season, which was the best season. We was 10-1, and, one, and uh, 
really enjoyed it. Being involved in athletics like you were for a good portion of your life, what did that teach you from athletics that you've taken over into your everyday life, your business? What attributes has that really given you? Well, it has given me discipline for one thing. I mean, uh, you know, just from the standpoint of knowing that uh, you have to get things done and, and on a timely basis, uh, you must study hard, you must utilize what you've learned in school, uh, and you must be able to uh, communicate real well because uh, sports is about making good friends, having a camaraderie that you do, uh, being able to uh, develop the personality with many, many friends, associates, and business, but uh, the most important thing is, uh, is just basically this taught me discipline, uh, how to be a very disciplined uh, person and giving me the opportunity to meet new people and be able to associate with them and their opportunities. So, Final question for you, looking back on, on your career at Tech and since you've gotten out of school, do you stay in contact with the school? Do you still see people that you made friends with up there, that type of thing? Well, I still see a lot of friends, yes, I do, and that's real good. That's one of the good things, again, uh, that has helped me out in business. I've run across a, a lot of people that I didn't even know that was uh, in school with me at the same time that knew mostly about me, more so than I know about them, because they may have not played athletic sports on me, and I've been involved for a couple of years in, in the school. But uh, I do stay in contact with uh, as many uh, of the alumni as I do. I do go to some of the meetings, and uh, I have not uh, been able to attend as many functions as I would, I would like to have. I've raised a family, and uh, you know, when you got to raise three individuals, uh, three kids, a wife, and three kids, you know, it's not easy. Plus, the fact owning a business, and uh, you know, as a business, you know, it's not eight to five. Anymore where you got to really uh, spend uh, around the clock hours on the business. And so it's important and uh, from that standpoint uh, that you really uh, keep going and, and doing the things that you have to do on every day. But uh, I, have, uh, I am intending, you know, on being able to be more involved in the alumni. And uh, I, of course, I keep up with all the games and keep up with how the school's doing and try to uh, get involved. And in, uh, I have not been involved in recruiting what I like for being involved with recruiting and being able to counsel some athletes that uh, you know, may need the assistance. I just would like to know overall what the school is all about, how it is playing in the Southwest Conference. And, uh, and I'm available, and I have been available, and I'm busy with a lot of individuals. But I do keep up in touch with a lot of guys. And one of the good things is that they all have come back and, and uh, stayed here close around in here in the city. The ones that left the city and went to Texas Tech University, they. Uh, they have been here and they've come back and gotten involved in business and uh, you know we've been able to talk about a lot of good things and be able to associate and socialize. When one begins the university experiences they do so for many reasons. On the academic side of the experience, the best of all worlds is when you combine academia and real life experiences. Well, that's exactly what happened at Texas Tech University in 1987. Ford Motor Company and the Mechanical Engineering Department joined forces, according to Dr. Timothy Maxwell. And you know what? They came up with a better idea. The, the first funded work with Ford started in January 1987. And it was about a $250,000 project. There were five faculty members and about six or eight graduate students involved in the first year of the project. And one of the things we tried to do is put together a team research effort to address specific problems. And as I mentioned, the two areas we looked at, one was the underhood airflow management, and the other has been what was referred to as wind engineering. So the wind engineering was, was done primarily on the highway with actual cars and with uh, the computer modeling and it was to look at the, what kind of wind forces and what kind of wind conditions does an automobile actually encounter as it drives down the road, both from the natural wind, whether the wind's blowing, what kinds of gusts of wind are typical, particularly with respect to crosswind sensitivity of the vehicle. When the gusts of wind are blowing perpendicular to the highway and your car is swerving back and forth, you, you like to minimize that. In fact, you'd like for the driver to not even notice it if possible. 
and then the, the non-natural winds it's uh, simulated when you pass a large tractor trailer and the, the gusts of wind that come off of that and how that affects the vehicle. So the project basically grew each year and I can't remember the exact levels of funding every year but it, it has grown to where it's approaching a half a million dollars a year now and it's everything's all all going fine. In fact we've already had discussions with them as to what kind of topics we're going to work on for next year. In the last five or six years we've probably doubled or tripled the level of funded research and we've also at least doubled the number of graduate students in the department. So there's been a direct influence on the number of graduate students and we get applications now from all over the country and from people that have heard about the program, students at other universities that want to come and, and get involved and we get applications from all over the world but most of them outside the country aren't as aware of this specific project. You know. Definitely. The undergraduates, we have a series of mentioned a design project that started the whole thing, or, or at least got us talking in a specific sense with Ford on the, on the whole project. We still have those courses, and every one of the undergraduates has to go through that course before he finishes. And we have, the, this work and some of the other automotive-related work we're doing sim stimulates a lot of the projects that they're doing. We looked at the, the little model, uh, wind tunnel model for testing radiators over in the other building, and that was built as a student project. We have a, a normal wind tunnel that was built as a student project and a, a water tunnel and, and various and sundry pieces of this that aren't necessarily the critical parts or, or something we have to have done in a week or two. We can assign to undergraduate students and have them involved in it, and it gets them, draws them into the interest into the program and draws them into the graduate program as well. So what is happening here between the Ford Motor Company and Texas Tech University not only should have ramifications locally, but it could impact the automobile industry worldwide. You might say, as far as Ford Motor Company and Texas Tech are concerned, quality is job one. For the video season ticket, I'm Eddie Clinton. played a good football team today and we played a team that knew, knew how to win, they did what they had to do to win the game. We had a ton of opportunities. And we're just not good enough to capitalize on them right now. We played the kicking game atrocious. We can't win close football games playing the kicking game like we played the kicking game. We can't do it. I thought we played a uh, tremendous game on defense considering the field position we had all day. We had two or three missed plays, but we had a really great defense. Coach, line of thinking on the uh, fourth and one in the both deep uh, Well, we were, uh, <laughs> that wasn't a very good call. Once <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we had it back. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we felt like we had a chance. And so we, we went that went that direction, and I uh, wish we had it back, made the first down gone down the road. Uh, what about your offensive line in the second half? It seemed like they got a little out of muscle. I believe they did, probably. They were, uh, you know, we, they have a, I tell you, Ohio State's got good, strong personnel, and, and uh, they did a good job. I, I still feel like we made a lot of uh, inroads today toward developing and coming together as a football team. The first game of the season is always scary, and, you know, uh, we had it all to go back and do again. Uh, you know, we, we played the kicking game better, and, uh, and we, you know, we're a little bit more consistent on offense. We've got a chance to win the ball game. What can you do about the kicking game? Just continue to work? Work like the devil. And uh, anytime that you're deficient in an area, you just got to spend hours and hours and hours. And uh, it always scares you anyway. We just didn't play it very well. They can probably fire the coach that works with it. That's me. <laughs>